Welcome to the WAGScast, a unique platform for empowering women and inspiring change, brought to you by Care Talks Women Achieving Greatness in Social Care Awards. Hello everybody and welcome to this WAGS video cast which is taking place in the midst of the election campaign. I'm Martin Green and I'm the Chief Executive of Care England and I'm surrounded by some of the most creative and dynamic women leaders in the care sector and I'm now going to ask them all to introduce themselves. Vic, do you want to start? Yes, I'm Vic Rayner, I'm the Chief Executive of the National Care Forum. Carolina Gavi, CEO of the Coworkers Charity and a former care worker. Hi, I'm Ann Taylor. I am a provider of discharge services and the chair of the Kent Integrated Care Alliance. Debbie Harris, the founder and managing director of Autumna, online directory of care services. Well, as you can see, we've got some really great experience around the table today. And I guess because we are in the midst of the election campaign, I want to kick off by asking people to think forward to July the 5th and whoever is in government, I would like to know what you would ask of that new government in its first hundred days. Perhaps the one thing that you could ask that would help social care when people are taking up their ministerial roles. Shall I start with you, uh, Debbie? Thanks, Martin. For me, there is one thing that um, the new government needs to do. They need to get health and social care talking to each other. I mean, that's it. They need to talk to each other because at the moment we're in silos and there is no parity between the two sectors. For me, that's it. Thanks. Anne? Um, yeah, I kind of have to agree with Debbie, but I think it's also about the finances as well. It's kind of clearing up what is health, what is social care and what is an integrated service and what it should look like. Carolina. Workforce, workforce, workforce for me, obviously. Um, pay for care workers. Um, making sure that they're really respected and recognised for the very important job that they do because so far I've not really seen much of that. So I think it's about uh, getting all of the ministers across the board to be thinking about social care first. So there's lots of, you know, would whoever the new government is, they'll undoubtedly be focusing on all sorts of different areas such as industrial strategy, apprenticeships, transport, housing, but having the impact and indeed the, op the, the focus on positively influencing social care, number one in their mind when they're thinking of those policies, I think could be really transformatory. Yeah, I think actually that raises a really interesting point, which is about how we try and get social care much more on the agenda of the entire government, mm. not to be seen only as a small part of the health and social care mm. sector. And I guess, um, it, how do you think we connect with the public as well as connect with politicians? Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to start on that. I think there's been some very interesting focus in this election around unpaid carers particularly. And I think that's been a hugely powerful narrative actually to, to I, it, instantly, um, if we talk about the Liberal Democrats campaign, which has been very strongly focused on unpaid carers, it talked about, uh, you know, the 10.6 million unpaid carers, the, you know, the 1.6 million care workers and said, we recognise what you do, we see you. And I think that's incredibly important uh, message to the electorate that actually the fact that you're involved in care, uh, either as a paid or unpaid worker, and you're valued because of that, um, I think is a really important message to the public. And I don't think whoever wins, I don't think that's one that will be forgotten. So actually being able to use that uh, to recognise the, the role of um, the impact that care has on really the whole population, that fact that it really does matter to us all is a message that we can continue to build on and strengthen as a sector. Yeah, Carolina, how do you think also we might improve the status of care workers and how do you think we can get that as a central theme for any new government? I think the conversation about care workers goes hand in hand with the conversation about people who draw on care. For me, one of the reasons why care workers are so underpaid and undervalued is because we don't value the lives that care workers support. So there needs to be a change in kind of disability um, a, a agenda and, and policy, which then hopefully will follow with further or improved recognition of what care workers do. And then also there needs to be a conversation about the size of the social care workers, like we've mentioned, 1.6 million care workers, you know, an absolutely massive workforce, 
and a variety of roles, supporting lives of people both in their homes and in different services. And I think we need to keep reminding people that what care workers do is incredibly important, not just anybody can do it. And that's very important to me, that not just anybody can be a care worker. Many people from different backgrounds can come and work in social care, but not just anybody can do it. And just showing what huge impact care workers have on people's lives, because having a care worker support you is life-changing for many people. Um, Anne and Debbie, you both talked about integration, and I know that you're both involved in um, services that are about people coming out of hospital. And it's quite interesting in the campaign, we've heard a lot from politicians about how they want to improve this uh, pathway from hospital to either people going back to their own homes or indeed going into care services. And I guess this is something that every politician has talked about for the last 35 years. Millennia. <laughs> but none of them have delivered. Um, Debbie, let's start with you. What would you say would be the thing you would tell politicians that they need to do in order to get that integration and that pathway mm. uh, established as part of an integrated health and care system? Mm. Well, it's interesting. Um, we've actually just done a survey and we've surveyed um, social care providers, care homes, home care and live-in care. And it's currently running at 95% of them, regardless of whether they actually receive a referral from the hospital or not. 95% of them would like the government to change the process of hospital discharge. I mean, that's a pretty astounding number. Um, when you looked at care homes, as another example, 50% of them didn't believe that the hospital discharge team understood what care they offered. 50%, and, and we hear this all the time when we're speaking to families, um, you know, they've sent us to the wrong care home or they're trying to put mum in the wrong care home. So I think it's got to be communication. It's got to be clear and verifiable communication so that if somebody's getting it wrong, you can trace who's getting it wrong and put it right. So I, I think it's communication, and it can't be manual communication in the way that it is now. Please, you know, you, nobody's got that much time to keep on ringing on the phone. Anne, you've got great experience of discharge in Kent and it'd be really interesting to hear your views, particularly from the perspective of somebody who's been doing this and doing it very successfully. Um, there's a number of older people that shouldn't be in hospital in the first place. So I think when we're looking at the problem of discharging, I think we're not looking at the problem of these people actually being in hospital when they don't need to be. And that's all around community services and social care at the start of their journey. And again, it comes around to money. So a local authority will put somebody in hospital because then they stop paying for them. And it's the hospital's problem. And the hospital will <coughs> discharge them inappropriately because once they're discharged, it's not their problem. It's not their fund. So it, it does come around money, but we really need to, to front load that into a preventative service. I speak to a number of older people who say, please, please don't send me into hospital. And it almost sounds like the Victorian era. Mm. If I go into hospital, I'm never going to come out, I'm going to die. Hospitals are for people who need medical attention, not who need to be sitting in beds for 10, 13, 15 weeks, seeing a doctor maybe once a fortnight, and, and then coming out and actually being in a position where they can no longer fend for themselves. So I would, I would say let's put some money into the preventative and it is around social care at the start of their journey and preventative services that actually stop people going into hospital. People with dementia, it's the worst place for them to be and yet majority of older people in hospital have some form of dementia. They get worse. Yeah, I think also you raised that very interesting point about different budgets and also there's a dynamic here which is one uh, part of the system being quite national and the other left to localism. Vic, um, what's your view on where you think the, um, the, the barrier should be or the, the dividing point should be between what we have as a national position and what should be more about local decision making? I mean, I think, you know, we... we experience this from different members perspectives so you know there are clearly organizations that work across the whole country and and are finding themselves as in a scenario where that national local 
uh, division is uh, really unhelpful in relation to the workforce because it may require pay differentials in different parts of the country because of funding regimes attached to that, or it's about the collection of data, or it's about uh, you know the, the commissioning and contract requirements in different parts of the country. So there's vast amounts of inefficiency that are built into the system because of some of those divisions and, and uh, decision making. So I, I mean I you know I think that there any new administration needs to really think about where that where those positions should be. I think that there um, are models that we could look at that have been applied to different sets of services. So, uh, you know, I worked for a long time in the supported housing sector where there was a national program that funded uh, services but still enabled local decision making but not at the, not at the sort of discretionary uh, element that it is now. So um, that might be a model and if we move towards some form of national care service we may uh, find ourselves shifting some of those parameters uh, alongside that. I think that there are very small numbers of things that have this very localised differentiation that that appears to create vast amounts of um, bureaucracy and, and, and problems in, in that kind of way. I think the important bit is that people feel that the system that is there in their locality has some level of ownership and I think that's mm. the constant balance that we're struggling with. Um, so finding a solution that, that, that meets that isn't necessarily going to be immediately straightforward, but that certainly should be an ambition for any future reform programme that we disavow ourselves of the, of the kind of um, idea that absolute localism leads to better services in each and every scenario, because I think many people are on the sharp end of that and don't feel that that's the reality. Carolina, um, we've talked a lot about the workforce and, it, and the workforce has been talked about quite a lot in this election campaign and I guess our challenge is, if you look at demographics, we're going to need a significant increase in the social care workforce and I guess I would like to ask you where do you think that increase in the numbers of people are going to come from and how do you think we make social care a more attractive destination for people in their careers? I think for me, first of all, it's retention before recruitment, so we should stop this whole people coming and going so so often, especially if they've trained experience and they just burn out, they feel they can't continue doing the job. So that's like number one, we need to plug that hole so we're not losing so many people. In terms of new people coming in, I think when I look at the very young generations now, they're, they're very socially aware but they're also very aware of their rights and the treatment by other people. They just don't put up with, oh, you have to stay at work, you have to do overtime for free, you have to do whatever else. And that's where the, the whole idea that we've been really trying to put in front of politicians of treating care workers not as tools to deliver care, but as humans with their own human rights, will be very, very important. Because younger people are not going to come in, into social care to, to, to work very long hours for very low wages, with a lot of responsibility on the shoulders and not being appreciated for it. I don't think they're going to put up with it. So there needs to be that change of attitudes in, in terms of how we look at how, how care workers are treated and paid. But also, we really need to push then the narrative of what social care is and what care workers do. And what do they do? It's they make other people's lives better. They support people to live the lives they want to live. And that's an incredibly fulfilling career to have. It's an impossible thing, I think, in a way to put on paper to encourage people to go and try. So I'd be very keen for a lot of schools to be doing work experiences in social care settings because I think once you try it, if you have the right values, but like, oh, I don't want to leave. I, I just want to stay in social care. And I've, been, I've spoken to many people who've experienced that, including myself, like, this is where I want to be. But because it's so hard to put on paper that experience, I think we need to encourage as many young people as possible to actually try it. Thanks. Mm. When we talk about things like the integration agenda, um, I'm conscious that we have just been through in the last 18 to 24 months a massive change and we now got ICSs and ICBs. And I guess I was really trying to understand what your ask would be to an incoming government because clearly 
these new structures have not worked as effectively as people thought they were going to. So both uh, Debbie and also Anne, from your experiences, what do you think have been the big blocks that have meant that the ICSs and the ICBs haven't worked as effectively as they could do? Yeah, interesting one, isn't it? Um, so when we're working with hospital, trying to work with hospital discharge teams or any, uh, trying to get uh, patients out of hospital and into appropriate social care, the biggest issue for us, and perhaps the reason the ICSs and ICBs haven't worked as effectively, is that nobody's doing everything the same way. There's absolutely no consistency. Um, if, if I was to uh, try and write down on paper how you would uh, go through the process of a hospital discharge, there would be a hundred versions of it. It's, there's just no consistency. So is it surprising that if you put an organisation in at the top, and say, so do, do something this way. Everybody underneath them is doing something differently. So that would be my guess. But they don't talk to me, so I don't know. They won't talk to me. Yeah. And Anne, I know that you have got um, a particular experience in Kent. And particularly, I think there are some elements of one particular player not playing with other members of the ICS. And I just really would like to understand what you think the issues are in Kent and what you think the messages are for national politicians as they come into power around um, the fact that we haven't got a functioning integrated um, structure. And we come back to, to funding. We come back to a local authority who has a really tight budget and is trying to deliver social care and we have a national health service that is, it, you know, that's the sexy word, isn't it? You know, mm. during the election, it's all about the NHS because it affects more people than, the, than social care. You only know about social care when you need social care, when you work in social care. Um, so I feel that we have, we have a real issue around funding, but I think I've been around long enough where I saw PCTs and CCGs and CCG federations and actually they're the same people with the same jobs with a different title not doing what they really need to do. When I'm talking to a hospital trust that's having a problem and they're talking to me about what I can do, as Vic said, very localised, we need you to do that, this is what you can do, this is what we can afford and it's delivered. When you get to the ICB, it's, well we want to do it right across the county. Well, you can't do it right across the county because if you live in Grove's End, you're not in the same position as if you live in Tombridge Wiles or Seven Oaks. It's not the same place. So I think it should be much more localised. I think there's a real issue around where does the money come from. And all the time they're fighting with local authority and government budgets and the NHS not wanting to fund social care. So that's what we have in, in Kent at the moment. We have the NHS saying, well, we shouldn't pay for social care. And social care saying well, we shouldn't pay for health care and I'm sure that's right across the country um, so yeah let's stop renaming them because whatever happens to the ICB <laughs> it will turn up to be another name with the same people Indeed. well I'd like at the end of this um, video cast to just ask you if you could on a scale from 1 to 10 10 being as optimistic as you could be tell me how optimistic you are for the first year of a new government. Vic, so I go to you. What's your scale score on that? Well, I'm going for 10 because <laughs> wow. we've got to uh, work with and encourage and support whoever comes in as a new government to recognise the fantastic value that social care can deliver and the change and transformation it makes to people's lives. And if we aren't optimistic and positive about the need and the potential for change, then uh, we're going to find it really hard to bring the public and the, and the politicians with us. Thanks. Carolina? I'm going to go with an eight. <laughs> um, <laughs> optimistic, but <clears throat> I feel anxious in terms of how much work is going to, going to take to actually make it a priority for any future government. Um, like Vic mentioned earlier, that there are so many different things that are going to be looking at at, at the beginning of, of the term and it's just going to be a lot of hard work for all of us to keep pushing social care to the top of the list, to the top of the list, or at least the top three. Um, so yes, I'll stick with eight. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not an eight. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Perhaps it's because I'm a provider here. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm kind of, I don't think anything will happen in the first year. I don't think there's enough money going into social care at the start of this. I think it will take some time. I think it needs total reform and that will happen over five years. So if you're asking me what's going to happen in the first year, I'm going to be disappointed and I'm going with a four. Debbie. <clears throat> right, I'm going to go with two scores if that's all right. I'm going to be optimistic and go with the 10 because, God, I hope it's a 10. But realistic, I'm sticking with four, I'm afraid. Well, I'm going to finally say that I'm going to go with a 10 for no other reason than this sector has got the most creative and dynamic people in it and we've got four of them round this table. So I'm confident that because of the dynamism, the creativity and the commitment of social care staff and social care organisations, I know that we will do our best to make sure this is high on the agenda.